In the 17th century, the philosopher John Locke noticed that the intellectuals of his day tended to make big claims about the world without supplying convincing sensory evidence. Instead, Locke argued for intellectual honesty. If our evidence is not strong enough to answer a question, we should be brave enough to admit ignorance. This became one of the hallmarks of the scientific method. Hey, I'm Stefan, author of the Great World History book, and today we're going to talk about Locke's famous text called The Essay Concerning Human Understanding. Let's dig right in. And as usual, we start with uh, a portrait, so you know what the guy looked like. This is John Locke in his later years, and here we have him at an earlier date. So let's start. John Locke is one of the pivotal characters of a period known as the Enlightenment. His achievements were many, and let's summarize a few. In his essay on toleration, for example, he famously argued for religious toleration, claiming it was the oppression of the diversity of opinion that was the cause of the many wars in Europe. In his two treatises of government, Locke famously claimed that absolute monarchs violated the God-given natural right of their subjects, giving the people the right to revolt. Instead, Locke recommended a limited government that ruled with the consent of the governed. And this text would later become inspiration for the American Revolution. But today we're going to talk about another text. It is called An Essay Concerning Human Understanding. In this text, Locke set out to, quote, inquire into the certainty and extent of human knowledge. That is to say, it is a groundbreaking investigation into the limits of human understanding. Building on the work of Francis Bacon, Locke shifted philosophy from wild metaphysical speculations about the nature of reality toward the more basic problem of epistemology, meaning the study of how we acquire reliable knowledge it became an important contribution to the scientific method. Let's start with a quote. If we can find out how far the understanding of the mind can extend its view, how far the mind has faculties to attain certainty, and in what cases it can only judge or guess, we may learn to content ourselves with what is attainable by us in this state. Or in other words, we have to find out what we can reasonably know as human beings and what we cannot. To illustrate this idea, Locke used the following metaphor. It is of great use to the sailor to know the length of his line, the line in this case used to measure the depth of the water, though he cannot with it, with the line, fathom all the depths of the ocean. It is well he knows that it is long enough to reach the bottom at such places as are necessary to direct his voyage and caution him against running upon shoals that may ruin him. That is to say, the line cannot be used to measure the depth of the entire ocean, but is actually very useful on a small scale in order not to hit uh, ground. At the start of the text, Locke humbly acknowledges his limited contribution to science compared to the great masters such as Isaac Newton. We read, the commonwealth of learning is not at this time without master builders whose mighty designs in advancing the sciences will leave lasting monuments to the admiration of posterity. But not everyone must hope to be a Boyle, one of the great scientists of his day. And in an age that produces such masters as the great Eugenius, another scientist from the Netherlands, and the incomparable Mr. Newton, it is ambitious enough to be employed as an under-laborer, as Locke calls himself, in clearing the ground a little and removing some of the rubbish that lies in the way to knowledge. And that is how Locke described himself. In his essay, Locke mainly argued against the concept of innate ideas. Let me clarify that. Various thinkers, including Plato and Descartes, had claimed that some ideas are so essential to us that we are born with them. We are, they are in us from birth. 
According to Plato, for instance, learning something about the world was simply remembering an innate idea that was in us all along. The rejection of innate ideas has its origin in Aristotle. In his work called Posterior Analytics, Aristotle wrote that human beings aren't born with innate ideas, but only with the capacity to know. He wrote, we conclude that knowledge is neither innate nor developed from other higher states of knowledge, but from sense perception. And that is why Aristotle is often called the first scientist or the grandfather of science, because he understood that all knowledge that we have should come from the senses, a very scientific idea. In the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas summarized Aristotle's position very concisely. He wrote, nothing is in the intellect that was not first in the senses. Everything we learn about the world, we learn through the senses. Or in Locke's words, no man's knowledge can go beyond his experience. In agreement with Aristotle, Locke concluded, if anyone will say there are ideas in the mind that are not in the memory, I desire him to explain himself and make what he says intelligible. So if we have those innate ideas, why don't we know about them from the start? Why do we have to, it seems like we have to learn everything from our surroundings. So the idea of innate ideas didn't make any sense to Aristotle and it didn't make any sense to Locke either. Instead, Locke argued that we gain knowledge either through the senses, that's the first option, or through the reflection on this sensory data or thinking, that's the second one. Let's start with the first. Through the senses, quote, we come by those ideas we have of yellow, white, heat, cold, soft, hard, bitter, sweet, and all those which we call sensible qualities. For instance, quote, a snowball has the power to produce in us the ideas of whiteness, cold, and roundness. The second one was reflection. Reflection includes, quote, the operations of our own mind, such as thinking, doubting, believing, reasoning, knowing, willing, and all those different actings of our minds. And then he follows, and this is a very important quote, these two, sensing and reflecting, are the fountains of knowledge. From whence all ideas we have or can naturally have do spring. And another quote, we have nothing in our minds which did not come from one of these two ways. This is the main idea of his essay. So how do we form our ideas about the world from our senses? Well, this is how. Through the senses, Locke claimed, we can form simple ideas. With thinking, we can then combine simple ideas into more abstract ideas. These abstract ideas are formed when we notice similarities in the phenomena around us and group these phenomena together into more abstract concepts. But without innate ideas, the mind at birth must be a tabula rasa or a blank slate. This idea also comes from Aristotle, who compared the mind at birth with an unscribed tablet. And here we read Locke's example. Let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? To this I answer, in one word, from experience. In that all our knowledge is founded. And we continue, the senses at first let in particular ideas and furnish the yet empty cabinet, the mind. And the mind by degrees, growing familiar with some of them, they are lodged in the memory and names got to them. Afterwards, the mind proceeding further abstracts them and by degrees learns the use of general names. In this matter, the mind comes to be furnished with ideas and language. An interesting side note, modern psychology does recognize some innate ideas. For instance, newborn turtles seem to instinctively know that they have to move towards the crashing waves, but away from seagulls. However, 
our innate ideas that we do have in our mind are not necessarily true and should therefore not serve as scientific evidence. Therefore, the principle of luck still holds today that reliable knowledge about the world should come from one of these two pathways, the senses or reason. Locke then went on to discuss the limits of human knowledge. It is likely a claim that our ideas, which are in the mind, might not reflect the world itself out there. Also, it is possible that some knowledge simply cannot be attained through the senses. There might be questions that will never be resolved. This might seem very obvious to us today, but this was a new kind of humbleness that was so important in the development of science. As his most crucial example, Locke studied the available theories at this time on the nature of the soul itself. He especially tackled Descartes' idea that soul and thought are the same thing. Locke responds, how could anyone know that the soul always thinks? Since it is, quote, not a self-evident proposition, it needs proof. Locke continues, I confess myself to have one of those dull minds that does not perceive itself always to think, always to contemplate ideas. Nor can conceive it to be any more necessary for the soul always to think than for the body always to move. According to Locke, both body and soul are ultimately a mystery. We do not understand what it is. We quote, if a man says he knows not how he thinks, I answer, neither knows he how he is extended, how he takes up space, how he has a body. He continues, the body has the power of communicating motion by impulse. If I hit a ball, the impulse of my hand gets transferred to the ball. And he continues, our soul has the power of exciting motion by thought. I will my hand to move and then it moves. And he continues, the passing of motion from one body to the, to the other is as obscure and inconceivable as how our minds move and stop our bodies by thought, which we every moment find they do. We just do not understand how this happens. At the time, intellectuals also argued whether the physical brain can think or whether it required an immaterial soul in addition. Descartes was convinced that an immaterial soul was necessary. But John Locke didn't see any evidence for either case. We read, we have the ideas of matter and thinking, but possibly we shall never be able to know whether any mere material being, a physical brain, thinks or no. And we continue, it is not much more remote for our comprehension to conceive that God can if he pleases, super add to matter a faculty of thinking to the physical brain, or that he should super add to it another substance, the soul, with the faculty of thinking. How can we as human beings with our limited understanding know the difference between those two cases? In the present question about the immateriality of the soul, if our faculties cannot arrive at demonstrative certainty, we must content ourselves in ignorance of what kind of being it is. After reading this text, the French philosopher Voltaire wrote Locke, quote, dared modestly to propose, we will never perhaps be able to know whether a purely material being can think. Voltaire claimed that it was courageous of Locke to admit ignorance when insufficient evidence was available. As for me, Voltaire continues, on this matter, I boast that I am as stupid as Locke. And he further clarified, some cried that Locke wished to overturn religion, but the religion did not enter into the debate here. It was a purely philosophical matter. We as human beings just cannot know. It is a purely philosophical matter, completely independent of faith and revelation. Interestingly, Locke did believe in God. This seems contradictory nowadays, as we today believe that the existence of God cannot be proven through the senses. But in Locke's pre-Darwinian mind, it was, quote, impossible that things wholly void of knowledge and operating blindly should produce a knowing being. This is what we today call 
the intelligent design argument. We humans are intellectual beings, so we cannot possibly be made out of just random natural laws. So from Locke's perspective, there was direct evidence of God, namely we are the direct evidence of God. He continues, thus our reason leads us to the knowledge of this certain and evident truth that there is an eternal, most powerful and most knowing being, a God. <laughs> Interestingly, Locke even believed in miracles and even in afterlife, although he admitted that these assertions could not be validated through the senses or by reason. This seems to directly contradict with the idea that every knowledge according to Locke himself should come from senses or reason. So let me explain what was in Locke's mind. Locke concluded that these religious claims can only be accepted on faith. When our knowledge of something is only probable, he claimed, we can turn to revelation to God's Bible to help discover, quote, on which side the truth lay. This of course seems very inconsistent with the rest of his essay, but Locke did believe reason was necessary to judge whether revelation was true. The miracles described in the Bible, he believed, were enough evidence to be convinced that the Bible actually contained some messages from God. So in this way Locke tried to make his reasoning consistent, but of course um, this isn't accepted anymore today. And even during Locke's own time, other thinkers pushed the scientific outlook of the world to its logical conclusion. In their view, the Bible was often inconsistent with itself and also in opposition to the new discoveries of the scientific age. It therefore could not be accepted as the word of God. For instance, Baruch Spinoza living in the Netherlands saw no evidence for an immaterial soul, for an afterlife. He did not believe that God had personal knowledge of individual human beings and he claimed that the Bible was full of scientific errors. He saw no reason to equate God with anything other than nature itself. And here we end today's lecture on Locke's great text. If you want to know more, go to worldhistorybook.com and get a copy of my book. See you next time.